Hi, I'm James McElvenny, and you're listening to the History and Philosophy of the Language Sciences podcast, online at hifilangsci.net. There you can find links and references to all the literature we discuss. Today we're joined by Ingrid Piller, who's Professor of Applied Linguistics at Macquarie University in Australia. Ingrid has many different areas of expertise within the vast field of applied linguistics, including in intercultural communication, language learning, multilingualism, and bilingual education. Ingrid's also the co-founder and one of the leading contributors to the multi-author scholarly blog, Language on the Move, which has recently branched out into a podcast. And she's going to talk to us today about her latest book project, a collective volume that she's co-edited with several colleagues from Language on the Move about the experience of learning a new language and making a new life in that language after migrating to another country. This book will appear soon with Oxford University Press under the title Life in a New Language. So Ingrid, to get us started, could you tell us a bit about your forthcoming book? What is it about and what approach does it take? Okay, well, thanks, James, for having me on the show. So, Life in a New Language, um, first thing I should say, it's not a co-edited book, but a co-authored book. Okay. And um, I think that's really special about it. Um, so, it answers the question, what does it mean to start a new life through a new language and what kind of settlement challenges do new migrants face? And um, this is a question that myself and my students and my language on the move colleagues as you've said has been um you know a key research question for us over more than 20 years and um in the in the late 2010s a couple of us we're getting together and we're saying well look we've got a number of really interesting but separate studies and we've collected all these data we've interviewed and sat with and spent time with and conducted participant observation with so many migrants from so different so many different contexts over so many years why don't we actually get together and reanalyze those data? And so methodologically, it's a real innovation in that we are actually reusing data from existing sociolinguistic ethnographies. And um, so it's a data sharing project. And um, there are six projects that we, from which we bring together data. So um, there is one that um, started that I started in the early 2000s at the University of Sydney and um, that was an ethnography with highly achieving second language learners. So at the time I was particularly interested in people who had learned English to kind of such high levels that they could pass for a native speaker. And so um, that was the first cohort of um, people who went into it. Then another PhD, data from a PhD that focused on the experiences of European migrants to Australia. That was done by Emily Farrell and um, completed in 2010. Then three other PhDs completed here at Macquarie University, one by Vera williams Tete about the language learning and settlement experiences of African migrants to Australia, one by Shiva Motari Tabari about um, the experiences of Iranian migrants, and um, she was particularly focusing on parenting and heritage language maintenance in that context. And then data from another sociolinguistic ethnography with female migrants and how gen the focus of the PhD was on how gender influences the migration experience. And then the sixth project that went into it was a project that was funded by a new staff grant here at Macquarie University to Loy Lissing about the experiences of skilled migrants from the Philippines who arrived here under a temporary skilled work visa and went straight into workplaces and what their experiences were. And so we brought all these data together that we've we'd collected for separate projects. I mean, I have to say I was involved in all of these projects. I either was the PhD supervisor or, 
you know, the researcher or the sponsor or mentor of the research. So I was involved in all of these, even so they were actually, I mean, in hindsight, they were very disparate and some of the challenges in terms of data sharing, you only notice them like in hindsight, oh, if we'd done this more consistently or that more consistently, it would have been easier. But anyway, so we set ourselves the challenge of actually bringing all these data together and reanalyzing them with a new set of research questions focused on language learning experiences interactional practices like how do you make friends how do you actually find someone to talk to which is a not trivial problem experiences of finding work that was relevant to everyone regardless of how we had originally set up the research everyone wanted to talk about i mean we have so many data about finding work and not finding work at the level you want to find work then experiences with making family in a new context because inevitably your your family changes right some people are left behind but even like the people with who you migrate um you know your relationship changes new challenges arise like parenting bilingual parenting do you pass on the heritage language do you focus on english um, experiences with racism and experiences with belonging. How do you create be belonging and uh, a sense of connection? And so these were the research questions we asked of this data. And so overall now we then have an analysis based on data with 130 migrants from 34 different countries on all continents. Pretty much over a period of 20 years, the earliest of these arrived in Australia in 1970. And the last to arrive was someone who arrived in 2013. But in every case, the country that they moved to is Australia. Is yes, that correct? Okay. That's correct, yeah. yeah. And do you think language is a key feature of the migrant experience that you've mm -hmm. analyzed? Yeah, so I mean we're only looking at migrants from non-English speaking backgrounds. So yeah. all of them had to learn English. Yeah. Now, um, so that was a key feature of their experience because, you know, when you move to a new country where even if you've learned the language for a long time, you now need to do things through that language. Mm. And so that's the dual challenge, right? You need to still learn the language and extend your repertoire. Or some people arrive with pretty much zero English. So you learn English, but at the same time, it's not like you're in a classroom. You're in real life. You need to achieve things. You need to... Um, be able to rent a house, to find a job, to interact with customers, to, you know, go to the supermarket, maybe go to hospital, maybe have an emergency, um, but even also accomplish really trivial things. We um, start with one, one trivial sounding example that has really repercussions for the participants. So this is the story of a young woman from Japan who arrived in Australia when she was in her late teens. And um, the idea was for her to come here to, you know, improve her English, essentially. So she had learned a bit of English back in Japan. And um, the and when we first met her, she had been in Australia like 10 years or so. So after the study abroad experience, she had actually settled down. And one of the she had this traumatic memory of the first year of her um, time in Queensland that she was only able to drink apple juice and was like this absurd trauma <laughs> like yeah. oh, I could only drink uh, no sorry not apple juice orange juice so why only orange juice and she goes well I never liked orange juice but whenever I asked for apple juice no one ever understood me. Okay. And so we kind of reconstructed that probably apple juice um, would have sounded something like in a very Japanese act, something like apuru juice. And, you know, I mean, she didn't ask, uh, utter that word randomly. She always asked it in the context of some hospitality encounter. 
but no one ever understood her. And so people would shout back like, what? And, you know, she imitated this like loud kind of people being rude or saying this rapid fire. What do you want? And, yeah, yeah. you know, so she never got um, or, or just, you know, ignoring her. So all she could ever drink for the longest of time was orange juice. But that was sort of the example for actually being being ignored, being, you know, not given opportunities to learn the language when you are actually there in real life. So um, people are not necessarily sympathetic to adult language learners. I think that's the other challenge because as adults, you know, we're supposed to be competent. You want to, um, you, you're not focused on your language. That's for little kids, you know, I mean, we set up the world for children so mm. that they actually learn language at the same time that they are being socialized into whatever it is that a child needs to do. But a child really has, any, you know, huge responsibilities. And um, so when as an adult, you're kind of thrown back to that language learning situation where you're basically in the shoes of the little child, except you have responsibilities, you have serious things to do, and yeah. you're supposed to be competent to know how to order a drink in a restaurant, right? I mean, that's no one gives you any, cuts you any slack there. And um, so that sort of encapsulates the story, encapsulates the challenge that all our participants experienced really to regain their adult competence through a medium that they were still learning, going along, mastering. And do you think you could make any generalizations from these studies to the migrant experience mm -hmm. sort of internationally? Because in some ways, maybe Australia and other English-speaking mm -hmm. countries are a special case because English has this status today internationally mm -hmm. as a sort of neutral default language mm -hmm. that is used in international mm -hmm. encounters. So do you think that the experience in Australia can be generalized more broadly? Yes and no. So um, no in the sense that, as you've pointed out correctly, English is a very different beast than any other language. And um, hardly any of our participants really arrived with zero English. Some had learned um, English for years and years and years as um, a foreign language and, and you and, and your listeners are probably familiar with kind of Kahu's mo uh, uh, circle model of English and we sort of used that as a guide because it was really quite helpful um, in the sense that some people come from these um, post-colonial societies where English has some official status and they had all encountered some English. But in those contexts, English is strongly associated with formal education. And so we have people, particularly from African post-colonial countries, who actually had a lot of oral proficiency in English, had a lot of experience actually communicating multi uh, multilingually, picking up new languages as they kind of went along. And um, they arrive in Australia and all of a sudden their English no longer counts. That high oral proficiencies that they have, they're not recognized. So all that people seem to see in them is either that they're low literacy, because some of them had very disrupted education, or if they did have, um, you know, good levels of edu formal education, still they were often treated as if their English wasn't real or as if no one could understand them. So we have this example, for instance, from um, a participant from Kenya who actually, you know, had all her education through the medium of English. She, um, I mean, her English was, she had a slight kind of East African accent, but essentially it was British English. I mean, it was more formal than most, the way most Australians speak English. And um, she had this experience that she was applying for a job in um, some customer facing role and then the pe person who interviewed her said you know you, you're fantastically qualified but you know what I can't actually give you that job because um, my clients won't understand you and mm -hmm. 
there really is no way this was a problem of understanding. No. Because, I mean, if you hadn't seen her, mm. then you would have understood. So it's this kind of um, McGurk effect problem that you you judge the proficiency of people also on their embodied person, uh, embodied identity and what kind of stereotypes you have, or may have about that embodied identity. So um, going back to these multilingual experiences, the other thing that I've said about this group from the post-colonial countries um, who, where English has an official status, so they were highly multilingual and they were really quite used to learning new languages. So that was nothing special to them as it often is sort of in Western contexts. Um, however, in Australia, all of a sudden, that didn't work anymore because um, it wasn't this kind of multilingual repertoire that people could build on, but it was all this monolithic, monolingual English. Hmm. And so, um, although they had a lot of English, still the kind of English that they brought was very different from the kind of English that was um, needed here. And so um, that created all kinds of challenges and mismatches, particularly in terms of education, in terms of credentialing, in terms of finding jobs. And um, the other group that we had were from countries that would conventionally call countries in the expanding circle. So they had learned English through the school system, like as a school subject, often over many years, they'd done tests and tests and tests. In fact, the testing was reinforced by um, Australian migration regulations that actually in order to get um, a skilled independent visa, you need to demonstrate a particular proficiency level of English. But what these people, so these people actually, they came to Australia, they felt my English has been certified by the Australian state. You know, I've got a visa on the strength, amongst other things, of course, that my English is okay. So I have certified competent English that gets you like 10 points in mm -hmm. um, for the visa. And, and then they arrived and they had this huge shock because um, they felt they couldn't understand anything. So they didn't have the kind of oral proficiency or communicative competence. And some of them were saying it's because, um, you know, Australian accent is so different. It's not Oxford English or whatever kind of British or American English they'd learned. But it was also just really, um, you know, be, being in different communicative situations. Like, for instance, um, one of our participants told us the story about how she, you know, arrived in Australia, needed to get a phone. And um, she had very high IELTS level, goes to get a phone and just said, I didn't understand a word of what that salesperson was saying to me. Just couldn't, couldn't get a phone, right? And um, that seems like a trivial thing. But again, you know, the, the, the kind of English that people bring is very different from what you actually need yeah. in real life, so yeah. to speak, or in this kind of real life. So in that sense, English or the, the language learning and settlement challenges are also similar to learning another language. Whatever kind of proficiency you bring, you will have a whole lot of adaptation challenges, but um, there's no doubt about it that for most other languages, people start at zero or, or are likely to start closer to zero than they are for um, English. Yeah, or perhaps other post-colonial mm. languages like perhaps French. That's right. And you've sort of touched on this point, but uh, do you think it's fair to say that migration is not just about a person or, or people mm. being transplanted from one land to another but is a formative process that affects the identity, not only of the person uh, who's migrated to the new country, but of the society mm -hmm. that they move into. So are there any generalizations that we can make about that, mm -hmm. about how migration and identity and language interact with each other? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, absolutely. So in a st that's what we try to say in the title. You start a new life, mm -hmm. right? Migration in many ways is a break with your former life. It's a break with the daily habits you had. 
it's a break with um, the career you might have built. It's a break with your, um, you know, your your family and friend, your social circles, because they will be away. I mean, even if nowadays where we have all these virtual contacts and social media, which weren't available um, for many of our people in the participants in the early migration phase, even then, um, you know, you no longer have the sexual face-to-face -face contact and. Um, having, you know, even if you have maintained daily contact with someone left behind on WhatsApp, it's very different from actually being in the same place with that person and being able to do things together, to have a meal together, to just sit together. So in that sense, migration is a fundamental break and you have to re-establish yourself. You have to re-establish your routines, understanding your neighborhood, um, you know, your, all your financial, socioeconomic responsibilities, you have to build a new home, you have to find new... So if you... Um, I mean, one, one other generalization I would say, I would make is there was a clear difference between people who migrated as individuals and those who migrated with a partner or as part of a couple or couple with children. Um, so that really makes a difference in terms of how they kind of, you know, whether they had a ready-made partner available, whether they maintain the language and so on and so forth. But even if you migrate as a couple, the couple relationship changes because um, like one thing that many of our... Um, uh, African participants in particular said like at home you have a lot of support for like looking after the children and keeping house and you know there would always be other family members and mothers and sisters and that would be a lot of help particularly for women. Many of the women really found themselves in more traditional gender roles post-migration mm -hmm. than they were pre-migration regardless of where they were from. Partly that had to do with, um, you know, that there's just much more reproductive labor that needs to be done after migration because you may no longer have that help. But um, also, um, like, maids may no longer be affordable or something like that. So there is more work to do, and it's just the two of you or even the one of you. So that was um, a problem then um, because many... Actually, most of our participants, if they already had um, professional qualification, their professional qualification was unlikely to be accepted or re-accredited at the same level in Australia. And women in particular ended up either just kind of doing jobs instead of re-establishing their career or, um, you know, deciding that actually this was now the time for them to become ho homemakers and um, just concentrate on their families. And so that's why so many women ended up in more traditional gender roles, very surprisingly. To get back to sort of the uh, methodological mm -hmm. questions about, about your study, could you tell us a little bit more about the data you've recorded in the ethnographies that form the basis of the book? Mm -hmm. So what form do the data take? Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned that you've tried to make the data open and reusable. Um, how, does, how does this work with qualitative mm -hmm. data? Because it's not just numbers that you can run through a Python script. It's something that has to actually be read and interpreted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I say um, open, we're not making the data openly accessible. Like We were sharing the data amongst ourselves, if you will, so we created um, a joint data set, but we're not going to make that openly available um, for all kinds of reasons, including um, that we don't have the ethics approval to do that, and um, we have actually really no clue how we would anonymize that. So there is no intention to make the full data set available as an open data set. So the data sharing is sort of amongst our projects. 
the projects that came together in that book. Um, now, your other question, what kind of data do we actually have? So um, that's really sort of your whole gamut of um, ethnographic data from um, participant observation data, recordings of naturally occurring conversations, interviews, lots and lots of um, individual and group interviews, formal and informal interviews. Um, in some cases, we ask participants to um, keep diaries of particular experiences. So we have those data. Um, we have all kinds of um, artifacts that they engaged with or that they shared with us. So, um, yeah, that's the corpus, essentially. So the sort of the sharing within your group comes about through a shared practice of analysis and discussion of how the various forms of data uh, can be analyzed. That's correct. Plus, we did actually create um, a specific corpus based mm. on bringing together all these data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Those are all the questions I was going to ask. So thank you very much for answering okay. them. Well, can I just say the book will come out online in May okay. and um, then the actual physical book should be out by June. So watch the space.